give a warm welcome to Harry Roberts. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, right, this talk's pretty enormous. We've got 116 slides, so I'm just going to sprint through it. Um, CSS for software engineers for CSS developers, kind of a, a weird recursive title. Basically, we're going to be looking at traditional computer science paradigms, principles, design patterns, uh, and how we can apply them either directly or indirectly to CSS. So writing CSS from a point of view of a very traditional computer science kind of developer, uh, and recycling that work just so that we as front-end developers are a lot more pragmatic. We work quicker, we work more effectively and efficiently. So we are going to look at some very specific um, principles, design patterns, and we're going to apply them uh, to our CSS. Now I say, yeah, apply them to CSS. Some of the things will need some creative treatment, so bear with me. Uh, but it's basically going to be looking at applying these very traditional design patterns to the front end. Um, it's only really in the last, in the last sort of five to ten years that front-end development really got difficult, and we start to worry about things like abstractions, architecture, performance, scale. Before we dive into this, I want to start with a really brief history lesson, very, very brief, uh, and it starts with these two. Uh, this is actually my mother and father on their wedding day in 1984. Uh, weirdly, my dad looks like the Unabomber. I realized this on stage. I have some questions about where my father was in the 60s. Um, but yeah, they got married in 1984. Uh, these two are really important to me. Um, obviously, they're my parents, very important to me for that reason. Uh, but they, all, they also provide me with a really obscure, very particular professional benchmark. And it's a very personal benchmark. It won't apply to most of you in this room. But both of my parents were born in 1959. They were both born in the same year. And the reason this is important is because as well as being the birth year of both my parents, 1959 is widely regarded as being the birth year of the first modern programming language. A uh, very contentious subject, um, you know, defining what the first modern programming language actually was. Uh, but it's widely regarded as being uh, flowmatic. Uh, and people, the reason people believe it to be flowmatic is because this was the first language that actually used English words to manipulate data, the first electronic language that looked like something we might use today, and it was, um, it was developed by a woman called Grace Hopper uh, between 1955 uh, and 1959. Uh, has anybody heard of Grace Hopper? Quick show of hands. Nowhere near enough people. Uh, you must go and uh, research Grace Hopper, incredibly important woman. Uh, she did some very pioneering work in, uh, in sort of the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, arguably one of the first modern computer scientists. Uh, she did some very important work with the US uh, military. Uh, and anybody who has heard of Grace Hopper has probably no doubt um, seen the archival footage of her explaining how long a nanosecond is. Who's seen that video? Okay, only a few of you. Uh, absolutely amazing, right? It, this video really gives the impression that Grace has got a very can-do attitude. She's kind of a no-nonsense kind of person. And nothing sums that up better than this for me. This is from the Wikipedia page about Flowmatic. Uh, basically, she went to her managers and she proposed this, this new programming language. And they just didn't believe it was possible. They just didn't think it was even doable. Uh, but instead of being disheartened and put off, uh, she rolled up her sleeves and did it anyway, which I think is absolutely incredible. So the reason for this is uh, this, this talk of, of the first programming language. Uh, software engineers have been doing this for a lot longer than I've been doing CSS, a, a lot longer. If we look at this, uh, this benchmark, this, this timeline that I mentioned, uh, 1959, uh, Flowmatic and my parents came along. So when I think about the context of the work that I do, it's basically the same age as my parents. Right? Modern computer science roughly is the same age as my mother and father. Uh, in 1990, I came along. Uh, in 1996, um, my youngest sister and CSS were born. Uh, she doesn't like that this slide is in this talk, as you can imagine. <laughs> I think she looks like Winston Churchill. Um, but yeah, so what I'm getting at here is this is a very, very personal timeline. The difference between CSS and the first modern programming language is the same as the difference between my parents and my youngest sister. That's a huge, huge chunk of time. That's 37, 38 years of, of very rich history. We've got this entire chunk of our industry that we could look to for inspiration um, and just kind of begging, stealing, and borrowing different patterns and paradigms. This is a huge, huge, rich chunk of time. And I've made absolutely zero excuse throughout my career that I, I look to this period for inspiration and guidance. And just looking at the kind of the problems that have been solved for the previous decades, right? Decades before I even existed. 
So that's what we're going to do in this talk. A lot of interesting patterns and paradigms and principles came out of this, this, this chunk of history. You've got all the combined knowledge of the world's first computer scientists solving problems that had never been solved before, that didn't even exist before, uh, and taking their work and kind of shoehorning it into the web, into CSS specifically. So to start off then, we're going to look at the dry principle. Who's heard of dry? Yeah, most of us. Don't repeat yourself. Um, who's heard of the single source of truth? Okay, slightly fewer hands. So I like to think of the single source of truth as like a philosophical backdrop to dry. Uh, dry is what we do, and a single source of truth is what we get. So let's start off with a real simple example. Um, oh, sorry, uh, definition first. So every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. Uh, there's a really important word on this slide which I've neglected to highlight, and that word is knowledge. Uh, we're going to look at some confusion and uh, misconceptions around dry in a few slides' time, but it's all about saving the repetition of knowledge. Dry isn't about avoiding repetition completely, it's about avoiding the repetition of anything that is key information or knowledge. Uh, everything should exist once and once only. Uh, you shouldn't need to make the same change several times. Uh, I imagine many of you have inherited a project where uh, you make a change, and you save a file, and you refresh the browser, and nothing happens. And then you remember that, oh, I've got to change it in the JavaScript as well, or I've got to change it here as well, or in these three other places as well. And this is nothing more than just an effort, right? It's a pain. It's a, not a nice way of working. So dry also, as, as, uh, as well as kind of the knowledge um, aspect of it, uh, a lot of people misunderstand the fact that it's not to do with small file sizes. Dry isn't a performance principle. Dry is a principle designed just to make your life easier. It's des uh, designed to make systems more manageable and maintainable. Uh, we take this simple example, and we've probably seen CSS like this uh, quite often. Just some simple utility classes for nudging, uh, spacing around. So I guess this 12 pixels here uh, is knowledge. I'm guessing it's kind of important to this, uh, the system because it's probably our base spacing unit. It's probably our baseline grid. Um, so these four values are all 12 pixels for the same reason. I could assume that if one of them needs to change to 15 pixels, they all must need changing to 15 pixels. A really timid example, but I've just quadrupled my workload here. Um, simply whip that out into a variable, and we get this single source of truth. So by drying out this CSS, we've achieved the single source of truth. Dollar unit is our single source of truth now. This is about as simple as it gets. So let's look at a slightly more complex example. Here we have three completely unrelated rule sets. These rule sets have nothing to do with each other. But they've all got this sort of thematic repetition. Whenever we define this certain font family, we have to design a, uh, define a corresponding or declare a corresponding font weight. That means if the font family ever changes, we've got quite a large task to go through the project and update 700 to perhaps 500. Um, simplest way to tackle this is to use an argumentless mix-in. Has anybody ever heard the saying that argumentless mix-ins are bad? Anybody ever heard that? I ask this every time, and there's only about three people at each conference. I don't know where I read this. But uh, a lot of people argue that argumentless mix-ins are bad because it just generates the exact same CSS. It doesn't actually create anything different or new or unique. Therefore, it's just leading to repetition. It's just leading to bloat. This comes back to that mis uh, this misunderstanding. Um, even though it gives the exact same output, we've still dried this out, right? We're still uh, saving the maintenance overhead on our part. So generating repetition is completely fine. Dry isn't a practice or the practice of removing repetition from a system entirely. It's about removing repetition from uh, a source, right? From removing repetition from source. Uh, the single source of truth, then, is the practice of structuring this information uh, so it's stored exactly once. Like I say, slightly more philosophical backdrop for me uh, of, the, of the dry principle. Um, key data should exist once in source. This gives us a massive uh, increase in confidence. When we know that we only need to change something once and it will propagate through the system, it means we can work much more quickly, more effectively, and more confidently, more safely. And it just keeps things nice and tidy. So yeah, confusion with dry then. Um, dry in source, not in production. Um, it's not about avoiding repeating any string whatsoever anywhere inside your project. It all comes back to knowledge. Uh, you often see people over-engineering the dry principle. Uh, they will avoid writing font weight bold more than once in a project, and then they'll use a ton of SAS extends to make sure they never repeat font weight bold more than once. Uh, this is a complete over-abstraction, and this is this, this problem with taking dry to the extreme. 
Uh, automated rep automa uh, automation of repetition is completely fine. If you've got repetitive CSS that goes down the wire to a user, uh, that's not the worst thing in the world. Gzip will get that back. Um, repetition is fine if it's automated. Dry is not about small file sizes. Dry is about a maintenance or ease of maintenance. Um, so yeah, actually, I won't read this out because it's kind of dull, but I, I wrote a quite an extensive uh, article on when to use mix-ins and when to use extends in SAS. Uh, spoiler, never use extends in SAS. Just don't bother. Um, but yeah, generating repetition, completely fine. Uh, another example, um, oh, this is the font weight bold one we just mentioned. Um, this repetition here is purely coincidental. Font weight bold happens to appear three times entirely coincidentally. To dry this out would be force it would be to force odd, unusual relationships in our code base. It would be unnecessary. We would put a layer of abstraction around something that never needed it. So if it's repeated coincidentally, don't bother drying it out. Keep the repetition in there. If it's purely coincidental, strings can appear as many times as they need to. Uh, going too far just creates these awkward, confusing relationships uh, over abstraction and, and obscurity. So to wrap this one up then, uh, use a preprocessor to store key data and variables. This is dead simple stuff. Uh, make use of mixins to generate repetition. Um, abstracting out design patterns, so object-oriented CSS or, or componentized modular CSS. We're abstracting design patterns out to avoid repetition there. Uh, don't draw anything if it was repeated entirely coincidentally. And, uh, and there's a really nice saying in computer science is that repetition is better than the wrong abstraction. I'd rather change a value four times then pick apart a 500-line mix-in that is over-engineered and over-complicated. So always err on the side of simplicity. Cool. Um, let's step it up a notch. Uh, the single responsibility principle. Who's heard of this? Cool. Quite a few of us. I think out of all the principles in this slide deck, the single responsibility principle is probably the most effective. It's the most bang for your buck. It's the one that I would implement soonest. Um, it says that uh, the single responsibility principle states that every class should have responsibility over a single part of the functionality, blah, 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 blah. Basically, it's just saying everything should do one thing, one thing only, but it should do that one thing very, very well. What we're doing is we're breaking bigger monolithic tasks into smaller instructions, smaller, more encapsulated instructions. This makes things much easier to understand. Instead of looking at a monolithic uh, series of instructions, we can look at much smaller, sort of compartmentalized, uh, series of instructions, and it makes things easy to put back together in different orders. There's actually a really, a surprisingly good real-world metaphor for the single uh, responsibility principle, and that's actually Subway, the sandwich restaurant. Uh, restaurant. <laughs> um, Subway applies the single responsibility principle to food absolutely perfectly, because when you go to Subway, you seldom buy a sandwich. You're presented with these ingredients. You put the sandwich together yourself. Subway have taken the idea of a sandwich, and what they've given us instead is a series of ingredients so we can, we can make exactly what we want. Uh, for me, this is the epitome of single responsibility in the real world. I think it's probably one of the most uh, effective metaphors when trying to explain this to people. We can make almost anything we like just by breaking it down into smaller, tinier ingredients. Uh, every part of this system has only one job, and it fulfills that job very, very well. This means we can start to swap things out, combine and compose things. We get a lot of flexibility. Uh, we get so much flexibility, in fact, that we can make 6,442,450,944 unique sandwiches at Subway. All of them taste identical, but it's true. We can make 6.4 billion sandwiches at Subway just by providing customers with the ingredients. Just by breaking these down into individual concerns, we can create a massive array, a huge variety of new, unique things from the same basic parts. Uh, somebody did actually work this out. That URL at the bottom, someone did the math, and they, they've proved that you can make 6.4 billion Subway sandwiches. Um, just to take this analogy a little further, here we've got this, this monolithic sandwich. Monolithic sandwich is my favorite phrase. I enjoy saying that. Uh, we've got this monolithic sandwich. We can't really do anything with this now. Uh, it's fairly permanent, it's fairly set in stone. Uh, we could extend it, perhaps, by using an inheritance model, but it's very hard to take things out of this. Now, if we were to build this via composition, using the single responsibility principle, we can combine and compose these classes to build the exact same sandwich again, but with much, much greater flexibility, because if, like me, you don't really like tomato in sandwiches, just get rid of it. So just by providing developers with the ingredients, we allow them to create 
exactly what they want uh, and modify it on the fly. They can extend it. They can do a number of different things to make this a much more versatile component. So if you're working in a team, especially if you're working in a team, try and provide your colleagues, your peers, with the ingredients. Try not to be too opinionated. Don't give them the meals. Give them the ingredients to make the meals themselves. Uh, a more realistic example, when you start to refactor CSS onto the single responsibility principle, this is the workflow that I kind of take. Uh, we've probably seen CSS like this uh, all the time. And there are a few things wrong with it. Firstly, it's called button login. Um, we've tied ourselves to, to a specific use case here. We can only use this button for logging into things. Um, but secondly, we've actually got mixed responsibilities. We can identify different uh, responsibilities in this rule set. A responsibility is technically defined as a reason to change. So this, this bit of CSS technically has three reasons to change right now. We've got base responsibilities. They might change. We have structural responsibilities that provide a padding value. And we've got cosmetic responsibilities, which just provide a look and feel. We've got three reasons to change inside this one class. We should identify these responsibilities and just break them out into combinable, composable uh, classes. Uh, this is a much nicer way of working. And of course, we can extrapolate this into a much wider design system. And this is now becoming very, very standard practice. This is a much nicer way of working uh, in sort of large and growing teams where speed and, and flexibility are very important things. But the next principle I want to discuss is the separation of concerns. Who's heard of the separation of concerns? Yeah, most of us. Uh, the separation of concerns is really interesting. I really enjoyed researching this principle for this talk. Uh, if you've gone the Wikipedia page for the separation of concerns, you get this beautiful, eloquent, really nicely written uh, description. Um, I won't read this out to you, but I, I would encourage you to go and check out uh, the, the original formal definition of the separation of concerns. It's really nicely written, and it made me realize something quite important. The separation of concerns doesn't really have much to do with the quality of code. It's not really about writing good code. It's not about writing fast or effective code. It's about understanding and reading it. When you uh, start to look at the definition, what gets discussed is the idea that we should be able to look at a program on Monday and study its syntax right, and think about nothing else. And on Tuesday, perhaps we study the program's features and we ignore the syntax. And on Wednesday, we should be able to look at the performance of this program whilst ignoring the features and the syntax that it's using. It's about compartmentalizing and worrying about one thing at once. The word worry will appear quite a lot in this section. A separation of concerns helps us to worry about one thing at a time and ignore anything else that shouldn't be related. So everything should be responsible for itself and nothing more. Uh, this means we can study features in isolation. It means we can safely make changes to one thing whilst simultaneously ignoring everything else. We should be able to do that very, very safely so we don't worry about more than one thing at once. Quick examples in CSS. Don't bind CSS, uh, sorry, only bind CSS onto classes that are for CSS. So don't have JS hyphen classes in your style sheets. Uh, avoid writing selectors that look like, like uh, DOM trees. Header, U-L-L-I-A, for example. What we're doing is we're just loading our style sheet with DOM information there. Uh, don't bind CSS onto data attributes. This is quite a controversial one, but the data attribute exists to store data in the DOM. It's not as, it doesn't exist as a hook. It's not designed for that. Uh, and don't bind JavaScript onto CSS classes. If you've got a class in your markup which is purely for styling, try and avoid adding behavior to that class. Take this a little further. Uh, the top example, role equals navigation. Um, problem with this is that role equals navigation uh, is an accessibility hint. It's an Araya role. It doesn't have anything to do with CSS. This should not appear in a style sheet. It has nothing to do with how a page looks. The second example, header nav ul lia. This is, this is just putting a load of DOM information straight in our CSS. Uh, people who argue against class-based uh, CSS architectures claim that we're putting style information in the DOM. To circumvent that, you have to write selectors like this, where we're just moving the, the work elsewhere. We're putting DOM information in our CSS now. Uh, the third one, many of you might even recognize this, but we actually used to use HTML to provide styling. We didn't even have CSS. One of the main reasons CSS was invented to give us this separation of concerns, to make sure we can have one thing without the other. Our uh, content layer should not be uh, also providing our styling. We should be able to separate these and worry about one thing at once. And finally, yeah, just using JavaScript to target a CSS class means that we can't have behavior and style independently of one another. These are all bad things we should avoid. Now, to take the top example a little further, as responsible front-end developers, I would hope that we all write our HTML first. Uh, HTML is more important than CSS. Uh, we should write it first, uh, make sure it's semantic, accessible, well-formed. 
Uh, but once we've done this, we need to style this thing up, and, and quite frequently we might, we might sort of think, oh, well, there's a hook already, uh, already there in the DOM now. This is already there, it's convenient. I'll just use this to now style this bit of HTML. Then we go on to write CSS like this. We're just loading our style sheet with DOM information. We've got accessibility information here, we've got DOM structure information here. It's very inflexible. I can't now refactor my HTML without worrying about if my styles will break. It's a very inflexible way of working. I have to worry about the two simultaneously. I'm going to show you the flip side. I'm going to show you how we should build this. And it's a bit of a shock because it's quite a departure, but this is what the HTML should look like. Uh, we'll step through exactly why this is appropriate, exactly why this is better for, for larger and more flexible systems. The first thing we worry about is our semantic concern. Semantically, what does this bit of HTML represent? What am I going to tell users, assistive technologies, search engines? What am I going to tell them that this bit of HTML actually is? Once we've made that decision, we should be able to forget that, we, that it ever happened. We forget that we made this decision. We step on to the next thing, which is, how am I going to present this to uh, assistive technologies? Right? What array roles are appropriate on this bit of HTML? I can change the semantics of this HTML now and still keep the exact same accessibility hint. I don't have to worry about my semantics anymore. It's a separate decision. Then we step forward into our stylistic concerns. Regardless of the semantics and the accessibility I've chosen, I now am only concerned with how this bit of HTML looks. That's all I'm worried about right now. My concern right now is stylistic. And finally, behavioral concerns. Keeping these things entirely separate means I'm free to worry about one thing at once or change other things without any risk of a knock-on effect. I'm keeping them completely decoupled so that when I'm working, I can work compartmentalized and confidently. Um, good examples of the separation of concerns. Uh, unconventional one, but grid systems. And I'm talking like div class equals grid, grid systems. Unconventional, not the prettiest way of laying out pages, but it keeps your layout well away from components. There's no point having a nice modular design system if you put a width and a float left straight on your sidebar or on your nav. Putting your, or treating your grid system, as a grid system or your layout as a separate entity means we can worry about how a page is laid out independently of what the page contains. A uh, topical one at the moment, I guess, writing CSS in JavaScript. Uh, I'm feeling really uncomfortable about the way we're heading with this. Um, putting CSS in JavaScript means that we can't make changes to our JavaScript stack, our, our sort of uh, JavaScript layer, without having to worry about rewriting or potentially binning our CSS layer. Uh, a guy called Keith Grant puts this way better than I can. Uh, if in 14 months you, uh, you want to find a new, or sorry, you find a new view library that you want to try out, you're out of luck. You're going to have to invest a lot of time pulling styles back out of JavaScript and back into CSS again. Cool, right, let's step on. Um, immutability, who's heard of this principle? Yeah, a few of us. It's quite in vogue right now with the sort of JavaScript and the functional programming world. Uh, immutability applied to CSS is quite an interesting concept. Immutability deals with mutations or, or lack thereof. Uh, an immutable object is an object whose state cannot be modified after it's been created. Uh, this sounds amazing. This sounds really good. The idea that we can create something, have it in a system, and whenever and wherever we view it, it's always going to be the same. We can't modify it. We can't mutate it. This provides us with a lot of confidence. It means that however or whenever we view something, we should be able to be completely 100% confident in how it's going to behave, how it interacts with us, how we should interact or interface with it. This really helps us debugging things. If we know that one thing is constant and it never changes, uh, we don't have to have different caveats when analyzing a system. We don't have to remember that, oh, OK, actually, this class over here does something different than when it's in this part of the DOM here. So it removes these caveats, states, and conditions. An example of a mutation in, uh, in CSS would be something like, uh, something like this. This is a fairly common example. We've got a grid system. We've got a class of col6, and it just makes something 50% width. We then get a very opinionated decision that says, well, when we're on a small screen, just collapse all the columns into one. Right? Just make sure that everything is in one straight line uh, and just handle things that way. Now, of course, that's a, a bad decision in general. But for the CSS, we get a problem. We actually get a problem in our CSS here in that col6 is mutated. Call six is either 50% or 100%, but it's only one of those depending on how and when we view it. It's kind of Schroeder, Schrodinger -y CSS. It's, it's a very uh, tricky and confusing way of working. We have to remember these caveats and states and conditions. When I'm debugging this class in this view, it should be this, but I have to remember that in this view, it should be something else. Call six has one input, but two potential outputs. And like I say, those outputs vary depending on how and when we view them. It's been mutated, and this leads to confusion, unexpected outcomes. And unfortunately, CSS is almost entirely designed around mutation. CSS is a very mutable language. 
Uh, we can circumvent it in a lot of different ways. So we can actually get around the specific example we're looking at uh, by just using another class. Uh, these are a thing that I call responsive suffixes. Uh, it's only call six apt small. Don't worry about understanding what's going on on this slide. Uh, there isn't any kind of like voodoo magic. Uh, what I'll do is I'll tweet a link to an article that discusses this technique. But what we're doing here is we're no longer mutating anything. We're using a completely different class. We've got call six, and then we've got call six at small. We've got two inputs and two outputs. We're no longer mutating anything. We actually have a brand new class to handle the change in functionality. Uh, another example of uh, mutations in CSS, if we just take these little snippets of HTML and CSS, um, the more astute among you may have noticed a problem. We've actually got a specificity mismatch here. The selector subcontent h2 uh, has a higher specificity than text center, which means that this heading right now will be text align left. Despite applying a class of text center to this heading, it's going to be aligned over to the left. The problem here is that other parts of our code base can modify unrelated bits. Uh, because it all operates, CSS all operates in a global namespace, we get these mismatches, these subtree collisions, and we get these regressions. A completely unrelated selector has mutated the behavior of a utility class. This is also fixable, uh, and it's, again, a pretty unconventional fix, so don't throw anything at me. Um, stick an important on there. All right, yeah, a couple of groans. Um, never use important in anger. Right, keen to point that out. Use important proactively. The only place I ever want to see important in a style sheet is on utility classes or helper classes. This is to force immutability. There is absolutely zero chance ever that we would use a class of text center and want the thing to not be aligned to the center, right? It's just it's not going to happen. If we don't want something to be text line center, we'd get rid of that class. So in utility classes, using important is actually advisable. Uh, never use important to get yourself out of a problem. Um, you should always favor different approaches, refactoring namely. Um, but using important proactively on utility classes uh, is, is actually a good idea. It's not just acceptable, uh, it's advisable. So to avoid mutations in utility classes, uh, enforce immutability with important. Another example of mutations in CSS is nesting. Right? We've got a button here that's got a certain font size. If we move that button into the promotional area on, on the page, we want that font size to increase. It wants to be a bit larger. The problem we've got here is that we've got one class, but two outcomes. One input, two outputs. We've got button, and then we've got button if. That's a mutation. We now have to remember that button has two potential states. Um, to fix this is real simple. We use uh, a second class to add that change in behavior. This is using BEM, the BEM naming convention. It doesn't have to. But now we've got two inputs, two outputs. We've got, no, we've got zero mutations. Uh, everything's defined in its own responsibility. Uh, this is an immutable way of, of designing or building UI. So immutability. Uh, don't have several states of the same thing. In order to achieve this, we can use uh, modifiers in BEM or responsive suffixes across responsive design. Uh, we can use important to force immutability on our utility classes. Uh, and it's all about removing states and conditions. It's about removing these caveats and these different variations of, of the same thing. This actually brings us nicely onto the next principle, uh, which actually isn't really a principle at all. Um, it's cyclomatic complexity. Now, who's heard of cyclomatic complexity? Cool, a few of us. The so cyclomatic complexity isn't strictly a principle. It's a form of static analysis. Uh, and this is, the, this is probably the most shoehorned example I've got in this slide deck. Uh, it's a very traditional, sort of very programmery way of measuring uh, complexity in code. Cyclomatic complexity is a software metric used to indicate the complexity of a program. It's a quantitative measure of the number of linearly independent paths through a program's source code. Basically, it counts the number of branches on a decision tree. Put very simply, it just counts the number of ifs and elses in a function. Right? Imagine a function with if this, do that, otherwise do this, otherwise do this, otherwise do this. Every if or else in that function contributes to the cyclomatic complexity of that bit of code. There's actually a, an equation for working out cyclomatic complexity. I have no idea what it means. Uh, just generally, all it really matters right now, all that we need to know is it's just the number of ifs and elses in a function. Uh, it's the amount of potential outcomes, given certain conditions. And as with many things, the more complex we are looking at, the worse. Right? We need to keep things as simple as possible. Now, the way we can apply this to CSS, and because people have famously said for, for years that CSS isn't a programming language, it doesn't have any logic, um, 
It kind of does, and it always has. I'm not talking about pre-process. I'm talking about since the beginning. Imagine a selector like this. This is a very unpleasant selector, but they exist. There's a lot of complexity here. There's a lot of logic. Because what we're actually saying is, if there's a div with a class of main, if there's a section with a class of content, if there's an H1, if there's a, an A, if there's a span, do this. And actually, because browsers read selectors right to left, we actually invert it. What we're doing here is we're asking the browser seven ifs. If you find this, and it's in this, and this is alongside this, and that is inside this alongside this, then do this for me. There's actually seven if statements here. That has a cyclomatic complexity of, let's just call it seven. Uh, there's a lot more complexity than necessary. Uh, and the reason we end up in this situation is just because of badly thought out selectors. When I do uh, sort of training and, and workshops, I train developers to see their selectors as two distinct parts. First, we've got the subject. This is the only bit we actually care about. This span is the only important bit in this selector. That's the bit we're styling. So the subject is the thing we're looking to style. This is just complexity. This is just stuff that we add in to narrow down the search. Because we picked such a bad subject, a subject like span, which captures a very sort of unknown amount of the DOM, we then have to start narrowing that search down by adding this complexity. Because we started off with such a far-reaching and uh, a sort of unopinionated subject, we have to add complexity before it to undo the effect of capturing too much of the DOM. The solution here is simply capture less of the DOM to start with. Start off much more explicitly. Don't start off by asking for a very, very greedy selector and having to spend time negating it or undoing it. What we need to start doing is targeting bits of DOM way more specifically to avoid this complexity. This now has a cyclomatic complexity of one. Is there a class of text highlight in the DOM? Yes or no. So deeply nested or qualified selectors are bad. They're bad for a number of reasons. Um, they increase specificity. Uh, they are much more fragile because there's more chance for something to go wrong. That previous selector, there were seven different chances for something to go wrong. That's just way too many. There's no need for that. Um, they're much more, uh, also they're much less portable. When you've got seven different conditions that need to be uh, satisfied before something gets styled, you can't just move that bit of UI around the DOM. It's going to be very, very hard to recycle and reuse. Even down to micro-optimizations, long selectors just make files bigger, right? They make CSS files bigger. Um, it is a micro-optimization. Probably shouldn't worry about that too much. But any dead weight, or sorry, any file size in a selector is dead weight. Uh, even the most intelligent minifiers in the world will not modify your selectors. It's too dangerous. It's too risky. So any bytes that exist in your selectors are completely wasted. It's dead weight. Keep your selectors as short as possible. And this then satisfies or aims to reduce, it ends up reducing our cyclomatic complexity. Um, try getting straight to the point, right? Target bits of DOM very, very uh, explicitly. Start from the beginning being very, very explicit with what you want to style. Uh, and then you just remove all of that dead weight beforehand. A really good example of, of where this goes wrong. Um, a friend of mine built a website about six years ago. He knows that I use this example. Um, I'm not just being a dick. Um, I'm a little bit being a dick, but not just being a dick. He had just learned how to use SAS. And I think you can see what he did. What he'd done is he just opened up the body selector in his style sheet, in his SAS, and just nested everything right the way down. Every selector in the project looked a little bit like this. And what this is actually styling is uh, it's just a button. right? A class of BTN would have sufficed, but instead we've got all of this dead weight. This is a very extreme example. Um, you know, people, hopefully, don't write CSS like this anymore. Uh, but this is a problem with kind of obscurity through tooling, right? Adding unnecessary, comp unnecessary complexity. Uh, and the, the kind of amusing thing was, uh, I started refactoring this. Uh, this, so this. This is what the selector looked like. There are actually 12 checks here. There are 12 chances for this to go wrong. It has a cyclomatic complexity of 12 to style one button. But it actually still rendered completely fine with all of that missing, right? A lot of the uh, dead weight we find in selectors is just that. It's dead weight. So keeping cyclomatic complexity low really, really helps us out in a number of different areas. So the open-close principle. Who's heard of the open-close principle? Oh, wow, not many of us. Cool. Um, OK, who works on a legacy project? Yeah, well, more of us. I'm really sorry. Um, if you work in legacy, or you work uh, in a fairly large environment where you know, there are lots of different developers contributing to the same code base, uh, the open-close principle is the one for you. The open-close principle is really good 
if you're working in a hostile environment or an environment where regressions seem painfully common, or if you're inheriting an old project uh, that you have to sort of maintain and look after, the open close principle is really, really valuable. It basically states that software entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification. Uh, I've got real beef with the name of this principle, the open close principle. The title misses out the most vital bits of information, like which one's open and which one's closed. Uh, so you have to remember it yourself. Um, open for extension, closed for modification. What this basically tells us is any time we want to change anything, we can't go back and change it at its source. We can't change something that already exists. If we want to provide changed functionality, we have to always build forwards. We have to add additional CSS. Uh, we'll cover off what this actually means in real terms, but um, it does sound kind of counterproductive or counterintuitive. Um, you know, we would like to go back and change things and refactor things, but in a hostile environment, a legacy environment, uh, even though it will increase the size of your code base, it's much safer to adhere to the, the open closed principle. So never change anything at its source. Uh, for example, it's June, right? And you go and you build some buttons and uh, you push them to the shared repository and everybody starts using your buttons that you've built. And then it's, you fast forward to December and you think, you know what, the buttons, I wish I'd made them a bit bigger. So you just go in and you change button from one rem of padding to 1.5 rems. And you push that to the shared repository and all of a sudden everybody gets this change. Everybody gets this change forced upon them. There's this huge domino effect. Because you went back and changed something at its source, uh, your, what you've forced everyone to do is accept these updates. By changing something that already exists, you're not giving people the option to, to, kind of, to, to, well, to opt into something. This then starts to cause visual regressions, undoing things, collisions, and it's really hard to keep track of these knock-on effects. We shouldn't go back and change anything that we've already put live because people will be depending on it. Um, however, caveat, there is one time we can go back and change something. I've got some more concrete examples uh, in the next couple of slides, but just to get this out of the way, there is one time we can go back and change something, and that's if it was a bug. If we built the buttons and we genuinely got the buttons wrong, we copied and pasted the wrong hex value or, or something like that, if it was genuinely a bug, we're allowed to go back and change how button renders. The, the cost of that is that we have to be very diligent. We have to look through the entire project and check that every instance of button is now correct. But the only time we're allowed to make a change at something's source is if we got it wrong. Any other change in functionality or additional functionality has to be added via a new class. And in CSS, this works really nicely because it uses the inheritance model, and we extend things that way. So for example, let's go back to the buttons. Um, 1M, 2M's padding. Uh, once we've put this out there, it's very risky to change it. We shouldn't go back and modify this now. But if we want a slightly larger button, we could just do, well, when it's in the promo area, do this. Uh, problems here are we violate the uh, sort of immutability principle. Uh, cyclomatic complexity is needlessly uh, raised. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is kind of a, a not nice way of solving this problem. Simplest way to do it is through this extension. We are open to extension but closed for modification. Adding a new class will inherit and extend the functionality, provide that change that way. This is a really safe way of working. Um, imagine, sort of picture the scenario. Um, you open a file, you open a CSS file, and you write a select like dot .promo dot .button, and you hit save, and you go and refresh your browser, and that button gets larger. That's a one-sided change. We only had to change our CSS for that change to actually take place. However, if we'd have added a class of button dash dash large to our CSS, hit save, refresh the browser, nothing would have happened because it's we, you know, we need to add that class to the markup. So what the open close principle forces us to do is make a two-sided change. We have to have a contract between our HTML and our CSS. We can no longer make changes from one location only. We have to make, we have to sort of uh, make the change in our CSS and then opt into it via our markup. This completely gets rid of the chance of regressions. The main reason regressions happen on websites is because people are recycling the same selector. Uh, and then people don't really go and check their work, and they might just break something completely unrelated on a completely different page. The open close principle forces us to be much more explicit when opting into this new functionality. Oh, right, the final, I think, hope, um, principle we're going to look at is orthogonality. Has anyone heard of orthogonality? Okay, a couple of us. Um, this is a new one to me, really, orthogonality. Um, it's quite a nice principle. It certainly helps with writing any kind of software. Um, but I like how we can apply it to CSS, because it tells us a lot very specifically about how we should write our, uh, our styles. Uh, orthogonality in programming, or programming language design, is the ability to use various language features in arbitrary combinations with consistent results. 
Basically, can we use bits of a language in a random order and still get consistent expected output? And if the answer is yes, we've got an orthogonal system. And this brings many benefits. Um, it reduces interdependence. It means that things don't rely on each other quite as much. Uh, we, can compose, we can compose things much quicker. We can put things together with a lot of confidence because we don't need the mental overhead of remembering in what order we need them. Uh, separates concerns, reduces collisions, blah, 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 blah. The way this applies to CSS, or a good way of checking how it applies to CSS, uh, is just can we randomize our imports? If we can randomize the order we import our components and the page still looks the exact same, that means we've got orthogonal CSS. It means that these components don't rely on each other. It means that they don't need each other to render correctly because we've compartmentalized and componentized things very, very well. So in CSS, orthogonality just means ease of, composabil or ease of composability. Can we just use things at random? If we can, that's the hallmark of a very, very modular system. We're striving for modular design, modular UI. Orthogonality helps us to achieve that. If we can arbitrarily combine things, we're going to get much more orthogonal CSS. Another good litmus test for if your CSS is orthogonal is can you nest things? Could you put one component inside another one with zero side effects? Uh, if the answer is yes, you've got an orthogonal system. And the best way to guarantee this is to use well-scoped selectors. This is quite a difficult example to step through uh, in slides, so please bear with me. Um, but what we've got here is uh, just some static HTML. Um, we've got a collision here. We've got a promo component, which, uh, whose heading we are styling via promo h3. Uh, but inside the promo, we've got this other H3 called testimonial title. The promo H3 selector has actually managed to affect how the title of the testimonial looks. These are completely unrelated bits of component, but they've got this regression. We've got this collision. Um, this is actually called a subtree collision. The, the, the technical term for this is subtree collision. And this is all down to, well, uh, sorry, badly scoped selectors. A real simple fix is write better quality selectors. Instead of using uh, DOM-like selectors or, or descendant selectors, um, swapping it out for a class just means that promo title has zero way of affecting testimonial title. We're not getting the subtree collision anymore. We've got much better scoped CSS. Uh, and this, again, is orthogonality. And this comes back to cyclomatic complexity. Always pick the most appropriate selector and keep it as short as possible. Nested selectors or binding onto HTML elements when you're writing component level CSS uh, leaves us very open and prone to these collisions and regressions. Uh, right, well, that was a bit of a sprint. Uh, that's me saying thank you for your time. Uh, covered quite a lot there. If you've got any questions about any of it, uh, grab me during the breaks. But yeah, thank you very much for listening. Join me over here. So I wish we had like three hours. <sighs> so, um, Harry. Yes. <laughs> um, you know that I've, uh, I'm a pretty outspoken uh, critic of, of class attribute based uh, systems, mm -hmm. um, or rather the use of them, right? Um, so that's why I wish we had three. In fact, as I think some people thought, well, the two of us on stage, that would be like akin to Donald Trump sitting down with the Mexican well, who's president. Who? <laughs> who's who in this story? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are so many questions, yep. uh, so let's just go through some of them. Uh, Leah asks, you advise against, uh, say, class foo, um, descendant selector li, mm -hmm. but repeating the same classes over and over is not dry if the HTML is not generated. How do you uh, feel about that? Uh, correct, but um, I try and generate my HTML. Um, yeah, <coughs> HTML is more important than CSS, but it's cheap, right? It's generated, it's spat out of a view layer or a template library or a CMS. Um, if you are handwriting lots of CSS, uh, lots of HTML, um, I would, well, first thing I would do is look to dry that out. I would look to start drying that out. If you can't do that or it's unnecessary overhead to add kind of a, a view layer, um, yeah, completely, completely predictable bits of DOM. We're talking lists or tables. You might be able to get away with nav space li or nav chevron li just to at least capture the first layer. Um, I would only ever permit that kind of stuff if it was completely guessable bits of DOM. Um, lists have to have li's in them. Tables have to have tds, ths in them. Uh, anything else, I would still go the long way and I would still, I would still write it out. And you know, if you're using a decent text editor, you can just write in columns. You don't need to actually write each li by hand. Okay, okay. So, um, 
there are so many. <laughs> um, doesn't the open close principle embrace visual inconsistency then by adding too many modifiers? Oh, right. Yeah, it certainly could do. Um, so if you've got like 10 modifiers on a button, because you're kind of having to extend it, I'd say you've got some kind of design tech debt there. Um, it's kind of a politician's answer, kind of avoiding the question. But a lot of this helps to surface inconsistencies in your design, right? So if you've got five different modifiers, you've got to be thinking, well, surely we've got the buttons wrong like drastically if we need this many modifiers. Uh, I wouldn't say it encourages anything. It permits it, perhaps. Um, so you have to be quite diligent. Uh, but if I was in a situation where I've got like 10 modifiers on a bit of HTML, I would start talking to my design team and saying, look, should we have a design sprint to just tidy this up and we'll refactor whatever the problematic component is? Um, I think the word encourage is a little, I don't know, uh, disingenuous. It permits a lot of flexibility, which you can use irresponsibly. Of course you can. Um, but the flexibility is a net win for me. OK. Um, uh, you, uh, <coughs> I do hope that Harry is kidding about the, his statement that you shouldn't hook your CSS onto DOM elements and structure. I don't think you were kidding, were you? Um, so I don't think element selectors should be completely banned from CSS. There should be a, a seam of what does an H1 look like without a class on it, what does a, a paragraph look like without a class on it. But as soon as we start to build components, I think leaning on DOM structure to style a component uh, is just very inflexible. Uh, and also leaning on a preset selection of elements that W3 have given us, it, it's not flexible enough. It doesn't, it doesn't really allow for uncertainty or change. Uh, if you think about a lot of, especially, so here's a huge caveat, right? Everything I'm talking about, it'd be, it'd be over engineering for like a small personal site. So I'm talking single page apps, large applications. If you think about how frequently DOM changes either in real time, you know, like a single page app or something like you know, Facebook sort of sidebar, things popping in and out of the DOM all the time, the DOM is a very uncertain place. Um, so leaning on uh, a guest or coincidental structure uh, just, just leaves for, it, it leaves you open to a lot of potential problems. Being explicit and saying, no matter where this DOM node exists, if it has this class on it, it will always look like this, uh, just gives us much more certainty. So um, you mentioned the W3C uh, selectors. There are mm -hmm. over 30 um, different types. Uh, what, what would you see the, the use, uh, use cases for those? That, I mean, you're generally doing class selectors mm -hmm. um, in a lot, of this, uh, a lot of your examples. What would be the use case for the other? Things in your in your. Uh, when you say other, do you mean like the other selectors, like uh, say descendant selectors and cool. um, attribute selectors, <coughs> etc. Um, so every project should have, uh, like I say, this thin seam of element-based selectors. There should be um, the way I look at it is, if we just write some Markdown and compile that into HTML, we should have something in our style sheet will make that look appropriate. Um, if you go full BEM, if you use BEM, uh, the complete methodology, you're not allowed any element selectors anywhere. Uh, that doesn't sit very well with me. There should be a sensible baseline. Um, so there's definitely a place for HTML elements. Uh, as soon as we step into component realm, then it should be, should be classes. So element selectors are fine for doing unnested. This is an A, an a element. This is a P element. This is a, a UL element. Uh, attribute selectors, um, I think if you can guarantee, so attribute selectors often rely on circumstance or coincidence. So if my class starts with grid hyphen, do this. Uh, one of the problems there is if someone introduces a new class which is, I don't know, griddle pan or something, you're going to capture the wrong thing. So attribute selectors, um, it just depends how certain you can be that they will match. Um, for kind of interesting things like progressive enhancement, or sorry, like little flourishes, like you know, if a link ends in PDF, put a PDF icon next to it perhaps, so a substring selector perhaps. But by and large, I think the safest, most guaranteed thing when working at scale, it's very unsexy, it's kind of boring, but just, use, just lean on classes. They're kind of workhorse. OK, I wish we had a lot more time, but unfortunately we don't, so, um, cool. but I'll talk to you later. Uh, <laughs> um, if I go missing, it was probably Stephen. <laughs> it's not that bad, it's not that bad. Thank you very much hey, for no, your talk. Thank you. Very <laughs>